Thank you everyone for joining for today's webinar, Powering the Future, a Massachusetts Clean Energy Workforce Needs Assessment. Um, before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping topics. So as you just saw, today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will share a link to the recording once it is available uh, to everyone here, along with a PDF of the slide deck. And we'll also be posting these to the Workforce Needs Assessment webpage. Um, we welcome you to revisit the content here yourself and share it with your colleagues. Um, we also invite your comments and questions. And with that, please take a look at the Q&A chat uh, to the right. Uh, there's a little chat box um, on your screen. Um, if you think of a question for the presenters at any point, um, you can type it in the Q&A chat box and it will either be responded to in the chat at that time, or we will uh, hold it until the discussion portion later in the webinar. Um, we'll also be looking for feedback using a uh, Mentimeter poll. Um, so have your mouse or cell phone uh, at the ready. Be great. Uh, we have three speakers as part of today's uh, webinar. First, we have Jennifer Applebaum, who is the Managing Director of the Workforce Development uh, Team at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, or MassCEC. Uh, we have myself, Elizabeth Youngblood. I'm a Senior Program Manager, also on the Workforce Development Team at MassCEC. And we have Phil Jordan, who is the Vice President and Principal Researcher at BW Research Partnership, our consultant for this initiative. As we walk through the agenda, um, Jennifer Applebaum will do an overview and report highlights um, of the needs assessment. Uh, we'll then pass it off to Phil Jordan to talk about demand for clean energy workers, um, also discussing fossil fuel workers as part of that. Um, that is our chapter three of the needs assessment. Uh, we'll then move to building a more robust and diverse clean energy workforce, which is largely chapter four of the needs assessment um, that Jennifer Applebaum will cover. Will be passed to me where I will uh, flag some, some various things that will, I think, be helpful in getting the most out of this report. Uh, we will then open it for questions and answers and then close out with next steps and closing. Before we uh, move on to the, the bulk of the, the presentation, I just we wanted to take a moment to get some feedback from you. Um, so if you take a look in the uh, chat, you will see a link to a Mentimeter poll. Um, this should just take a moment. You can also use your smartphone phone and use the QR code. Um, we want to get your feedback on what you're excited about to learn more about during this webinar. So just take a quick moment, uh, go in there. It should just take 30 seconds or so, and then we'll take a look at the results. Elizabeth, I just wanted to flag that I think the QR code is actually still going to the practice one, so people should definitely use the link in the chat. All right, okay. Some responses. Okay, I want to share the responses. Great, excellent. Um, well, thank you for everyone, and it's still it's a live um, live feed, so feel free to keep uh, putting in your um, your feedback here. Um, we will be covering all of these as part of this webinar today. So happy to see there's. Um, a lot of excitement to understand about the uh, clean energy workers needed to meet our climate goals um, and understanding gaps and, and the skills that are needed for, for these roles. As I said, we're going to be covering a lot of this. Um, we can, you will also have the opportunity to uh, ask questions as part of the Q&A to get a deeper dive into any of these particular topics as well. Um, so with that, uh, we are going to transition over to my colleague and boss, Jennifer Appledevam, who will talk about the report and the highlights. Thanks so much, Elizabeth, for the introduction, for giving us a sense of what today's session will look like. Um, so if we can advance, we'll jump right in and talk a little bit about what the scope of the report is and also some of the key findings. Um, so the goal of this report was really to go beyond a lot of the reporting that we do on a more annual basis. So for those of you more are familiar with our Massachusetts Clean Energy Industry Report, which is a really solid head count and picture of the industry at large in the state, the goal of this is to be more forward looking and to understand the worker need through 2030 in alignment with the state's um, CECP plan and specifically the, the phase decarbonization scenario that's in there. 
Um, and through that modeling, we're able to get a sense of what the demand will be in order to meet those climate goals. And then also go back and pull back and look at places where the demand versus the supply might be particularly challenging. And this helps us understand how to be forward thinking um, and where we need to pay more attention to make sure that we have the workforce that we need to solve our climate goals. Additionally, a, long, a strong focus of the report is really thinking through as we um, expand the workforce, how do we do so in a more inclusive manner? And what are some of the existing challenges around DEI? And how do we, how do we change the narrative on that through stronger strat strategies and supports? Um, the other part, and Elizabeth noted this at the outset in the agenda, is also being mindful not only of the additional clean energy workers, but how the fossil current fossil fuel worker demand might shift um, and where there are opportunities for really strategic transition for current fossil fuel workers to, uh, to comparable clean energy roles. So that gives you a good sense of what's covered in the report. Here you have sort of the top line picture of what the report has to tell us. Um, so for those of you who've already taken a look, you might notice that in the report, two big numbers are referenced. Um, 38,100 additional workers needed by 2030. And then we also talk about 29,700 FTEs. And the reason why there's two different numbers there is because in the clean energy industry, workers, some workers aren't spending all of their time on clean energy. To give you a sense of what that looks like in 2022, about 71% of clean energy workers in Massachusetts were spending most or all of their time so it isn't that most workers are spending a teeny bit of their time on this, but there is a differential between um, the work that needs to be done specific to the CECP and what a particular worker in an occupational role might do across their whole work year. Um, in Massachusetts, that intensity is already higher than the national average, which is closer to about 63%. Um, so, and we do see that shifting as it goes forward. So that 29,700 number is the full-time equivalent, gives you a sense of the amount of work that needs to be done. But from a workforce development perspective, the, 30, the 38,000 is really the important number to be thinking about when it comes to training. Um, so that's one thing that to highlight in terms of this. Additionally, you know, we bring up that as we've been tracking struggles with, um, with employers being able to find clean energy workers, it's at an all time high. So the industry reports taken an annual look at that. And this last year was 88% that were already struggling close to nine out of 10. Um, and some of this is not just specific to, our, to the industry, but across the board, because a lot of the labor market conditions are challenging. And actually the needle has already moved towards even being more challenging, even since the, we started gathering this data and really putting it together. So the numbers that are on this slide are reflective of May. May's unemployment rate, May's labor force participation rate, but the numbers have already in June or even the unemployment rates even a little bit lower. Same thing with labor force participation rate. So it continues to be a really tight labor market um, and that puts together a challenging perspective for thinking about how to find additional workers. The good news in all of this is that by and large, the jobs that are gonna be created through meeting our climate goals are solid middle to high wage jobs that provide a lot of opportunity for family sustaining, sustaining wages. And there is an opportunity, as I mentioned at the outset, to really think through how this transition can be particularly just in terms of inclusivity and in terms of uh, thinking about current fossil fuel workers. So the report highlights seven key findings. One of them is the one I just went over, which is sort of the top line number. And then across that, there's also additional findings and recommendations that categorize some of the things that we need to be thinking about with this work. Um, highlighting the importance of career awareness from, from a starting point, because without people knowing about these jobs and understanding what they are, they're not gonna choose the training routes or opportunities to get there. We also talk about how we look at the overall system, um, where we have assets in terms of workforce development programs and where there might be struggles or challenges. Um, I've mentioned the importance of a just transition. Another thing that I'll highlight, and Phil will get into this more, is the fact that so much of the growth, is, growth in these jobs is really condensed in the top 20 occupations. So those occupations that are going to see really, really high rates of growth require additional strategies. And then Elizabeth will go through this a little bit more at the end of the report, but we've noted not only the importance of having occupation-based strategies, but having regional-based strategies, um, because even though all regions are set to see growth, the dynamics will be different from region to region in terms of what will most help propel that growth forward in a positive way. So that's just some big picture pieces. I'm going to hand it over to Phil to sort of dive deep on the worker, the worker projections. 
Great, thanks so much, Jennifer. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here and, and uh, really appreciate the, the chance to talk about this important work in my home state of Massachusetts. Um, I am uh, gonna walk through some of the results today and just um, encourage everyone to really take a, take a solid spin through the findings and ask any questions that you may have because I think um, we're gonna try to cover a lot of material in a short, short period of time so that we can get to those questions. Um, but the first sort of data point that we wanted to share with you today is um, just sort of looking at the growth by the clean energy sub-technologies. And um, what you see here is uh, on the phased approach, as we mentioned, you know, there, there are a number of different ways that Massachusetts could achieve its, its climate goals. And this modeling is based on a, on a phased approach. Um, energy efficiency is, is obviously critically important uh, with really significant growth, both in the single family and commercial um, markets. Um, as well as as distributed solar storage, but there really is pretty significant job growth across all of the uh, categories. And would note that um, the the key here to think about is that you know the top three growth uh, clean energy sub technologies are three of the largest that we have in Massachusetts uh, already, um, and then uh, electric vehicles um, uh, and and traditional uh, uh, traditional and clean uh, transmission and distribution activities are really ones that are very rapidly growing and have been if we look at the clean energy industry report uh, over over the years. So really seeing sort of just an acceleration of uh, of a lot of growth. I did want to note that um, uh, you know it does it does seem like there's a, a lot of movement, especially with passage of federal legislation um, and certainly uh, increased emphasis on in state policy um, that we may see actually even more rapid adoption. Um, of some of these technologies and that, you know, higher electrification approach may be what we end up seeing in reality. So these numbers may actually be, uh, may be quite conservative, but in any event, um, you can see the importance of these, of these technologies and, and pretty significant growth across a number of technologies. Um, why don't we go to the next slide? So um, in addition to looking at the the growth by sub technology. We also looked at occupational categories, and the key takeaway here is really that you know, forty five percent of the clean energy jobs uh, by twenty thirty will be in construction, installation, maintenance, and repair, um, which is which is great, right? That's a great finding because many of these occupations have defined pathways and um, you know established apprenticeship programs, established training programs that can be really modified, right sized, right expanded, etc with a great infrastructure in place and often are careers that you know have some uh, lower barriers to entry, whether it be uh, because they have more learn and earn opportunities for folks who you know can't afford college or, or um, uh, can't afford a long term training program where there's no funding uh, uh, for pay coming in. Uh, but but really, you know, good accessible jobs that are created. But that also means that there's lots of jobs across a broad range of these skill sets and backgrounds. And so we see, you know, big growth across business and financial operations. Production occupations is one that's, you know, that, that sort of stands out as being a really interesting one, which is a broad category again, but really providing a lot of good, uh, good jobs and not an area that we've seen tremendous growth um, over the last few decades in, in, in Massachusetts. So really, if you look across these broader categories, you see really strong growth across a lot of different career paths that require very different um, education and training um, and skill sets. So just as a takeaway, you know, two, two key pieces here. One is great that there's significant opportunity for the construction, installation, maintenance, and repair positions, lots of job opportunity there and good pathways for those jobs. And then also really a lot of jobs across a broad range of, of careers. Next slide. So now we get into some more of the specifics um, of the occupations and the highest growth occupations. Um, and, you know, again, as we talked about, um, and, and as Jennifer alluded to, um, we did look across 140 occupations, but 65% of projected growth is captured across 20 occupations. And actually about a third of projected growth is, is captured across just five. So um, you see these, these, these top five is, is a huge number of workers um, in, the, in the construction trades. Um, electricians obviously stand out. We've heard a lot about electricians, you know, nationally, regionally, um, across the state, locally. Um, just a huge, hugely important um, occupation for us to be focusing on. Also, wanted to note um, HVAC um, 
and the importance of HVAC and particularly around um, you know, heat pumps and the importance of heat pumps to, to Massachusetts decarbonization goals. Why don't we go to the next slide? I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of how we come up with um, our risk of workforce bottlenecks and then sort of jump into what this means. So um, despite what everyone learned in Economics 101, there is actually a little bit more to this than supply and demand, right? Simply saying, here's how many we have and uh, here's how many we need. Um, because there's a lot of other things that go into looking at long range projections of the workforce. So uh, we, we worked with Mass CEC to develop this methodology to understand um, how to project out some workforce bottlenecks and incorporates, you know, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail um, in the interest of time, but it's, it's laid out in the report um, how we think about this. But basically we wanna look at a variety of factors. So obviously how many are, are projected to be needed and um, you know, how many are being produced currently by our our training system is an important first step, but we also need to look at things like uh, the demographics of the workforce for that occupation. So if, you know, if we have a lot of people, but they're all 60, um, that's not going to do us much good in 2035, right? So, um, so we look at, you know, things like retirements. Um, we look at the absolute number of workers in that position today, right? So if you have 10,000 construction laborers and you need to add a thousand more, um, you probably have more infrastructure in place than if you have 500 um, EV techs and you need to add a thousand more, right? Uh, so looking at that rate of growth over what the current uh, uh, what the current sort of infrastructure is today is important, and then looking at that training infrastructure and output and seeing um, you know how we are able to produce and ramp up and scale up that over time. So as we do that, we assign you know how how challenging we think the bottlenecks are going to be based on that variety of factors. And we see that there are some where there's really severe risk of workforce bottlenecks. And electricians and HVAC are the two that are the most challenging. That's driven by very high demand um, and demand from lots of sectors, right? Electricians are in demand for everything from, uh, you know, basically everything that Mass DEC cares about, right? And focuses on from energy efficiency to renewables to electric vehicle, uh, charging stations to smart grid and transmission, but also, you know, people building houses and companies expanding their footprints, right? They need electricians to uh, do all that work as well. So lots of demand for electricians in the general economy, as well as uh, in clean energy. Um, and then obviously HVAC, I mentioned already with the, the reliance on heat pumps. Um, we then have a high risk of bottlenecks across electric power line installers and repairs, there's just a lot of money flowing into and a lot of activity around transmission upgrades and distribution upgrades. Um, so electric power line installers and repairs can be really important. Um, construction laborers and building inspectors, including HERS raters and energy analysts, just really important uh, and, and, and high risk of bottlenecks. And then some moderate risk, um, which are insulation workers, cost estimators, and those pipe layers, plumbers, pipe fitters, and steam fitters. So these are areas where um, we are expecting to see strong demand, um, there's some good programs in place, but we think that there is certainly moderate risk of a workforce bottleneck. Uh, next slide. Switch gears a little bit and talk about regional job growth. Um, not surprisingly, Greater Boston uh, sees the most uh, job growth in absolute numbers of jobs, um, uh, being the, the, you know, the largest population center. Um, but actually, we see um, a majority of jobs are created outside uh, of Route 128. Um, for anybody who's not from Massachusetts joining the call, we talk a lot about Route 128. It's just sort of an important delineator that sort of helps us to think about, you know, eastern Massachusetts uh, and that sort of the core around the city of Boston um, versus, versus the rest of the state. So 61% uh, of jobs being created outside of Highway 128, which is important. Um, and actually the greatest proportional increase, like the, the fastest rate of growth will be uh, uh, Cape Cod and the islands. So, uh, and, 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 and the Southeast. So really strong job growth in the Southeastern part of Massachusetts. And then uh, for my final, final note, before I turn it back over uh, to Jennifer, um, we also looked at uh, fossil fuel worker displacement. Um, and so um, we do see a reduction of about 3.4% of projected uh, fossil workers. Um, interestingly, uh, this is um, not only is this offset uh, 
from the occupation level declines um, with clean energy job creation. Um, there, you know, a lot of the jobs that we're talking about here are are displaced from um, a transition around electric vehicles uh, to electric vehicles. We don't really know what that's going to look like yet. So this one's actually pretty hard to predict. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't know exactly what the model is. If everybody charges at home, everybody gets an EV and charges at home and there's no more, um, you know, Cumberland farms with a charging station, then, uh, then, you know, there may be some significant, um, offsets there, but, you know, if, if people are charging and, and going in and still purchasing the same kind of way that they would with fueling, uh, with gas, then, um, those would be much lower. Um, there are going to be some more, um, Losses expected after 2030, right? In a in a workforce needs assessment, we like to think about it sort of a tangible window of time when we can feel a little bit more confident about the projections. You know, these tra training programs cost money. There's opportunity costs for the participants. We don't want to really put lots of investments into what we think might be the case in 2040 when there could be breakthrough technologies. Um, but we do want to have this on the horizon and recognize that if things do move the direction that we're moving in, uh, we do think that you know there's a really important um, long-term uh, opportunity for us to plan around, um, uh, really just plan around those those transitions for the fossil workers. So um, I'm just I, you know, had a, a lot of information there. Try to try to get through very quickly. Um, lots more information in the report. Looking forward to questions that you have. And did just want to underscore um, Jennifer's comments before I turn back to her about the importance of. Um, you know, sort of recognizing that when we look at this report in connection with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Industry Report and those difficult that difficulty hiring that's creeping up every year and becoming really, really challenging, we are, you know, if we don't have the right responses, we are going to be looking at a case where we may not be able to meet those climate goals if we don't have the workers to do the work. And that's happening all across the country and especially in the Northeast. So um, I'm glad that there's so many people with interest in this topic, and I'm looking forward to seeing how Mass CEC, Mass CEC and other uh, agencies are working towards uh, uh, solving this and working with all of you and doing it. So with that, I will turn it back over to Jeff. Thanks so much, Phil. Um, so I think, you know, you've just got a good snapshot of where we expect to see increases across the occupations and how that breaks down by sector and regionality. One thing that the report really goes deep on is understanding the systems and the needs that can really propel additional workforce forward. Um, so Camilla, if you can advance. And Elizabeth will talk a little bit more about, you know, how to actually utilize some of the tools in this, but one of the key pieces of research what did result in a training inventory. Um, and in total, over 900 programs were reviewed. Across those 900 programs, we really looked more closely at 406 that were relevant to 32 occupations that were going to experience the highest growth and were the kind of programs that were really required um, for folks to enter the field. So there are definitely additional programs that are, you know, on the order of upskilling or enhancement, but what you're seeing here is a snapshot of those that are that are most relevant to the occupations that are going to grow the most and the ones that really represent how folks gain entry, entry to it. Um, that said, one thing about a pie chart is it tends to draw your eye to the biggest piece. Um, and what in this case, you know, the biggest piece is the voc vocational technical high school system. That is super important. And in many cases, we talk to employers about the occupations that are set to grow the most. And they see the vocational high schools as often the place where they're first getting that initial pipeline of talent. That said, in many cases, completing a vocational high school program does not put you ready to be completely full, fully through, say, an occupation. So like in the case of electricians, someone can do an electrical shop. They still need to go forward and complete their apprenticeship hours and go through the licensing process to become a master electrician. Um, so it's very much potentially part of the pipeline, but it's not the whole story. Um, that said, one thing to note, and this is, you know, it's exciting that in Massachusetts, the vocational technical system is so strong, but one piece of that is that there's actually much higher interest in students taking part of it, part in it than, than seats supplied. Um, so right now, the acceptance rate across the system is about 61%, which is actually lower than the acceptance rate at UMass Amherst. So that gives you a sense of how hard it is to gain one of these seats. Um, and in some cases where the vocational technical high schools are located um, in overlaps with environmental justice communities, the acceptance rates can sometimes be even lower. So Worcester Technical um, High School enrolled or accepted just 43% of its applicants. So very hard to get in. 
and the struggle to gain access to those seats constrains the very beginning of the pipeline for the workers that we need. So that's a definite area where we need to work on. Now the state's career technical um, initiative that provides these seats for after hours, you know, for students that are in comprehensive high schools to get some of that training or for adults to use their vocational system later in the evening does expand the capacity. Um, and there's more that needs to be done in coordination with that work. Um, I'll jump to talking a little bit about the post-secondary institutions, which are also very significant picture of this. And specifically, if we were to think about our community colleges or our post-secondary institutions that really serve a, serve a lot of technical fields, um, they're particularly significant to the roles that we're looking at. Within the community college system, eight of the eight of the community colleges are part of the 12 minority serving institutions. So when we think about diversifying and being more inclusive, they're a big part of of how they can play a role in this picture. One thing that we did hear a lot from post-secondary institutions is that you know, their area of expertise is really defining the types of training aligned to employer needs and making sure that training is high quality. Um, there's a more of a struggle sometimes around the wraparound support services that might be needed to allow a greater swath of participants to access and be successful. So in many cases, it's not just about one institution. It may be about a combination of institutions. Another thing worth highlighting on this is that, you know, when you look at the slice for union, which is largely the, um, the joint training apprenticeship centers, um, it looks like a small piece of the pie, but its actual impact is much greater than, than its number because the number of folks that are going through an apprenticeship class are much larger than say a class at a vocational high school or a program at a community college. So you can have um, large joint training apprenticeship centers that have apprenticeship classes on the order of hundreds. And that's very different in magnitude than um, a class that might be capped at 12 or might serve 40 across a whole year. Um, so this is useful as a snapshot, but it's really important to think about um, some of the granularity behind the numbers. Another thing that the report takes a look at that's particularly helpful as we think about workforce planning is how the presence of training centers overlay with environmental justice communities. And when we're talking about environmental justice communities, we're talking about those that the state has designated based on income, based on diversity, and based on English isolation. Um, and so there's a combination of metrics that help us understand places that require additional attention because historically they weren't more in a bigger burden um, when it comes to the environment and when it comes to energy. Um, those are in orange and then the little um, blue circles are, and you can see the different size circles, that sort of gives you the magnitude of number of training centers gives you a sense of where there are training deserts, where there are places where we should be thinking about how people can have more opportunities to access these careers. And realistically, there's not a training center within a reasonable commute. Um, and especially when we think about trying to ask folks to entertain career changes or upskilling while potentially working still a full-time wage job, it's particularly challenging if, a if the closest training center is 40 minutes away or an hour, that's really a non-starter. Um, in other places on the map, you can see that there's a density of training centers, and that doesn't mean that there's not a need for anything new or additional there, but it might mean that depending on how the services are working currently, that there might be a need for, say, additional support services more than um, a whole new training program to open up. So this kind of mapping helps us have more granular conversations. You're looking at the whole state map, but in the report, we look at this through the seven workforce skills cabinet regions. And that allows us to have really strategic conversations with the workforce system about where the needs are and where we can think about planning for additional programs. We have a, a range of these graphs in the report. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but one thing that the report highlights is representation by gender and racial ethnic um, attribute as compared to the broader workforce population. So in this chart, you can see the green line across the top represents the percentage of the Massachusetts workforce that's female, which is over half. Um, and then you can see across some of the most highest paying roles in the clean energy field, what representation looks like for women. And you can see some places where there's 
huge disparity and a real need for thinking about how do we bring more women into the field? How do we make this a, a job that's, you know, that feels supportive to them and inclusive? And also how do we address some of the real, very real barriers that may be different across gender and racial ethnic um, categories? So, you know, we would never expect in workforce to see a complete steady state where the representation absolutely mirrors the whole industry, but places like, you know, that where like electricians, where it's less than 2% currently, or electrical engineers, this tells us that there's a need for more targeted support to make to make women feel as though, you know, this is a good option for them, and to make sure that we're thinking about what barriers are specific to them. Um, if you go forward, we're going to look at just one more of these. So in the case of African Americans or Blacks, you can also see some cases where there's disparity. Um, one thing worth highlighting is the construction managers, where there's certainly underrepresentation, and it's that piece of often looking at you know different tiered occupations and advancement opportunities. So there may be um, there's closer to better representation in construction laborers by and large, but then at the manager level, you don't see that representation. And so as we think about strategies for workforce and inclusivity, it really helps put a put a fine point on places where we can be more strategic and supportive. Um, as I like I mentioned, there's a whole other series of charts in the report. We just chose to highlight two because of for brevity's sake. One other thing that the report featured was a survey of current workers in the clean energy industry to try and understand their particular barriers. And we did break down how they discussed barriers um, across both racial, racial, ethnic, and gender lenses. This one shows you racial ethnic. Um, and one thing that was true throughout is that for all, pretty much all the barriers that were reported, there was a higher intensity of that barrier being experienced by non-white and female workers. Um, so you can see in some cases where there's a definite um, gap there. And some of those pieces really require us to think more about workforce development choices. If you look at the pieces of training opportunities or employment opportunities, near where people live, it gets to that, it sort of syncs up with that earlier map around the environmental justice communities, and also makes us think about how economic opportunity may not be distributed equally across the state, and what mechanisms we can use to try and increase that distribution in places that have historically not had as much opportunity. Another thing that I'll just highlight real quickly on this chart is just that piece of overcoming prejudice or bias in the workplace. This is something that we really can work on as a community, um, both in the workforce development system, but also as we do employer engagement and work with our employers to make sure that their hiring practices are more inclusive and that their environments are more inclusive and supportive when they get there. And oftentimes this can be an education gap, even more so than an intention gap. Um, so there's a lot of good work that is underway and more still that can be done. One thing that we thought was worth really shining a spotlight on, and I mentioned this early because it was one of the key findings, is the importance of career awareness in the clean energy space. And so I think um, we have a little bit of like a tale of a tale of two two cities with when it comes to the occupations. It's like a tale of two types of occupations. We have occupations that people at least theoretically know of and are familiar with, you know, um, like a lot of the skilled trades positions that are highlighted as high growth, but people may not understand that those occupations are playing such an incredibly important role in solving our climate goals. And so for somebody who's thinking about wanting to have a career that's committed to climate or committed to improving our situation on this earth, they may not think of those first. Um, and then we talk about in the report of some good efforts that are underway by organizations like IREC um, and others to recast these jobs as climate heroes, um, because in fact they are. And I know that's something that, you know, um, our own Secretary Tepper talks a lot about, about how these skilled trades positions are the ones that are really going to help us move the needle on climate change and really save, save, our, save our environment for future generations. So there's that piece of recasting occupations and then there's also the piece of occupations that are quite new you know we think about some of the pieces that are crop, crop, cropping up in the offshore wind industry where they don't even have set titles yet and there's still a lot of movement on what a particular occupation may consist of or look like so to both ends we really need strategic and ongoing efforts to make sure that that career awareness is addressed not only because we need it broadly, but also it's another early place where we see differentials, where we see people of color and women having less of that information and less of that exposure to make those choices to be part of the workforce community. 
I won't spend too much time on this, but one thing, you know, I sort of said earlier when we we're on the training inventory is that it really isn't about a single institution. We're really finding that in order for workforce development strategies to be successful, it takes that old saying, it takes a village, it takes many players coming together. And in many cases, community-based organizations have a key role to play in being part of strategic workforce solutions that are more inclusive. And so we highlighted in the report some places where CBOs really feel the need, feel a need for support in order to be that effective player that they can be for their communities. Um, and a lot of it is around clear and reliable information, not only about discrete jobs, but timing of jobs. You know, Phil talked earlier about, we don't wanna ever put anyone through a training and have there not be a job on the end of it. Um, and CBOs that work closely in hand with communities have seen that happen and they're not, they don't wanna go forward with that step again, nor should they. Um, the other piece of that tighter employer engagement where, you know, sometimes it takes a convener like Mass EC or industry associations to help CBOs connect effectively. Um, and the other piece we constantly hear about is the funding models, the need for that to be robust enough to really anchor in those support services. Um, and the last one Lewis now mentioned is the piece of really looking closely at some of the skills that might already be in the community um, and taking that asset-based approach of understanding that someone might be very much ready and equipped to do the job, even though their licensing or certification or background experience may not sync up exactly the way that it would be in a job description. Um, so we're, we're starting to run a little slow on time, so I'll speed up just a little bit, but um, you know, I mentioned at the outset that across the years of the industry report that we've been tracking hiring challenges, that it's certainly gotten worse um, and that close to nine out of 10 are reporting that difficulty. We have some places that take a closer look at this. One thing that I would say is, you know, obviously not only it's about the hiring, but also about the retention. But in both those pieces, there's the, a question of looking at mismatches. Um, and one thing that we saw in our survey was that some of the top strategies that employers are using to hire did not necessarily match the top ways in which employees are looking for work. So employers really tended to rely on relational hiring, their own networks, um, even something like LinkedIn, which while it's an online tool, it's insular to your own professional network. This tends to be a less inclusive approach um, as opposed to job seekers that might be using more standard job sites or might be using their mass hire career center services or the services from their training providers. So there's a need to increase that utilization of those tools that are going to bring a broader range of folks to the table. Um, and then a need to think about really strategic retention strategies. It's not enough to just get someone in. We're not achieving what we need to if someone's coming into the role and they're gone within the first six months or a year. And a lot of that, those pinched points are around work environment and around ongoing barrier removal. So barriers are an issue in the training, but then they're also an issue in retention as well. Um, one last item before we move to Q&A. So one other thing that the report highlights is some best practices across the workforce development practice. There's a really useful table um, on page 54 of the report. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but it is a way for us to sort of put a pin on all of the different things that folks need to consider as they stand up or improve training programs. Um, some of them are certainly things that you've thought about before, like the importance of engaging employers early. Um, and then some of them are even more specific, I would say, to the clean energy industry in terms of what recruitment might need to be like. That, you know, for some of these jobs, outreach and recruitment may really need to include being able to touch the job or try it out or use VR goggles to get a sense of it. Um, so there is a broader set of needs that sits on top of sort of these best practices. And I think with that, that sort of wraps up my section. I'll be turning it over to Elizabeth who's gonna talk a little bit about how to get the most out of the report. Fantastic, okay. Um, so I'm gonna to touch on uh, three different things, uh, being mindful of time and really wanting to get into your questions. I'm just gonna give a broad level overview. Um, so as was mentioned, uh, there is a um, occupational gap analysis looking at uh, 10 occupations that have the potential to act as pinch points uh, to meeting the state's 2030 uh, climate goals without further focus and intervention. So this is just a quick snapshot of what you'd find in any, any um, of these kind of 10 sections. So first it includes kind of a primer on wages and demographic information um, and percentage of the workers that require a bachelor's degree or that are, you know, that are without a bachelor's degree, I should say. Um, and then a breakout of the kind of major clean energy sectors um, where, where these additional jobs will fall. 
Um, each has a breakout of demand and supply of, of workers. Um, as uh, Phil had mentioned earlier, uh, for this, for, for example, HVAC techs, um, there is a high number or percentage of workers that are 55 and older, 35 and older. And so um, in addition to the number of uh, full-time equivalent workers that are needed it for, for HVAC um, techs, uh, there's gonna be a quite a large number of retirements. Um, and on the supply side, uh, looking at the, the training programs across different type of training entities, um, and then also flagging that for many that, we, or for a subset that we're, we spoke to, uh, that uh, some of the, the kind of current trainings are undersubscribed. Uh, so for each of these sections, this looks a little busy, but uh, there are kind of recommended next steps. Um, and in some cases, it involves uh, increasing the density or the training capacity uh, across a range of stakeholders. Um, uh, recommendation is also to increase outreach and engagement about the HVAC tech position uh, to increase enrollment. Uh, a couple other examples here also include updating the curriculum to and training labs to support hands-on training opportunities with heat pumps and clean heating and cooling technologies. Um, and then also feedback on a particular um, uh, certification called the NATE that uh, may be valuable to incorporate into a standard training. Um, so this is uh, applicable across all of the different occupational profiles. Great. Um, so there, uh, this is uh, chapter six, regional analyses. Uh, there are uh, seven workforce regions across the state um, and the, they will all have different pathways to decarbonization as was mentioned earlier. Um, they'll have different employment projections and workforce challenges that will require uh, kind of strategies that are specific to each of these regions. So I'll just take a quick look through one of these regions uh, just to get a snapshot, uh, capturing the kind of current jobs and projected job growth, as well as the top growth occupations within that region. And then, um, Kind of specific recommendations for that region. So the Berkshire region, um, more than some of the other regions, has uh, some training deserts um, uh, across this region. It also has a lower uh, population density than the other regions. Um, but we did find that for, especially for electricians and HVAC techs, there is uh, there are some uh, pretty substantial gaps in training availability. Um, so part of this is capturing um, opportunities where that could be expanded. Um, and then also flagging that if you look at the environmental justice neighborhoods, especially in the north, um, it, it's quite a drive to, to get to any trainings. And so uh, thinking about strategies across regions or uh, potentially increasing a training capacity um, uh, further north as well. Right. Um, so I also wanted to flag uh, that there is a companion data workbook um, that is available um, on the uh, workforce needs assessment website. If you kind of take a look to the bottom right, there's a little um, arrow here, uh, get data set. And uh, this is a little bit of a hidden gem. So I wanted to talk about that uh, briefly. Great. Um, so this data set uh, really does capture a, a very large amount of the data that was part of the baseline for creating this analysis. Uh, so including, um, inclusive of the training inventory of those 900 uh, trainings that were highlighted earlier, certifications that are specific to each of um, the 32 priority occupations that we, we looked through, um, the uh, clean energy occupation estimates, as well as the fossil fuel occupation estimates, that's looking at the 2022 and 2030 projected numbers across those 140 occupations for clean energy, as well as fossil fuel occupations. Um, occupation demographics, uh, that, uh, provides a, a broad range of information about the, the wage of, of occupation, the, again, demographics, the age, um, and then also uh, what, you would, what, you know, what you would need to know to be able to get into that space. So um, the information by region, uh, there's also the survey top lines here as well. So this is, I think for many could be very useful. Uh, for any out there who really love pivot tables, uh, this, is, uh, this is Fantastic. So please, uh, you know, don't forget to download that as well. And if you intend to use the data for anything, uh, feel free to keep us in the loop on how you use it. And with that, we'll proceed on to the question and answer section and give you some time for your questions. Um, so we have several questions that have already been submitted by the audience. Um, as a reminder, if you have questions that you've not already submitted, uh, please feel free to enter that in the Q&A and we'll go through as many questions as time allows. Um, 
And if we could also uh, pin up both Jennifer and uh, Phil um, to have them both here, I will start us off with one question uh, to Jennifer, uh, what, which is, um, what is MassTEC doing to help create, to drive the growth of a robust and diverse clean energy industry? Sure, thanks Elizabeth. Um, maybe it's, it might be useful too to pull down the slides so that we can all be up. Um, so one thing I would highlight early is that, you know, through the Equity Workforce Training Fund, um, which is funds that were made available in March of 21 through a legislative action, MassEC is funding a large range of additional programs that are have that equity lens and focus on, you know, um, we're in, we had a, over 18.2 million available in funding this year. Um, and we had a lot of good response to that, a lot of really solid grantees coming across that are putting together solid strategies, both in terms of um, amplifying existing trainings or setting up new ones. Um, and we're close to being able to announce, you know, some of the good work that we're doing in that space coming off this spring. So I hope everyone can stay tuned to learn more about the work that's happening there, um, because it really does create a really solid foundation for us to expand upon in terms of addressing some of the things that the report highlights. Great. Um, I think we spoke to this um, somewhat, but I think it would be useful to bring up um, how many of these jobs will require college or other secondary education? And I'll pass that on to Phil. Yeah, it's a great question. It's a little bit more complicated because some some of the occupations, um, they may have a minimum standard where, you know, someone with experience could transition in. So it's not exactly perfect, but um, Eight of the 10 largest occupations that we reviewed did not require um, a college degree as a, as a, as a baseline. So, um, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a large number of these jobs that are accessible. Um, in many of those construction and repair positions, um, it's more of a uh, on-the-job training or apprenticeship uh, type program. Um, though there are a lot of construction manager positions, as an example, um, that are you know, very good paying jobs. Some of those positions are filled by people who go through um, apprenticeship programs through the ranks. Some certainly are folks who go to college and then uh, uh, go to work and, and work their way up. So it's a little bit of a challenging question, but um, we did also emphasize in this work, um, we did want to look at, at occupations that had uh, pathways that didn't require college. So some of what we did was an intentional decision to say, how can we really understand where there are some um, uh, occupations with growth that we can, you know, look at that, that don't require a four-year degree. We wanted, a, you know, a breadth, but I would say we, we probably emphasized um, a number of the careers that don't require a college degree for, for that deep dive. Great. Thank you, Phil. Uh, we have a question for Jennifer. Um, can MassCEC serve as a conduit to introduce community-based organizations that are without training to those that do have training programs? Absolutely. Um, and I would say that we already have done some of that and we want to continue to do it. So one thing that's a little bit different from some traditional RFP processes is that MassCC is really, you know, active in trying to promote matchmaking. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of open office hours when we have RFPs open, and that's a really great way for folks to come together to meet one another. We also maintain lists. Um, we share those lists, and then we also are starting to um, set a cadence of larger annual in-person convenings, which present an opportunity for our current grantees to share best practices, but also will provide an avenue for folks that are thinking about getting into the space, but maybe need to know more and need to meet those right partners uh, to connect. And then the last thing we're looking into is that we've set aside some funds towards a technology-based solution that'll help the ecosystem connect a little bit better um, and create a more transparency around where there are opportunities for partnership. Fantastic. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, we have a question I think could be answered by either of you. Um, when you look at training centers, are you considering the number of educators or trainers that are needed to meet um, the, sorry, that's off my screen, meet the demand? I mean, basically from our perspective, from the research perspective, the answer is, you know, it's one of the, it's certainly one of the, the factors that we would think about in terms of the training inventory and how it could be expanded. Um, but I think I'll turn it over to Jennifer to talk about whether or not Mass CEC is thinking about that in terms of how it's supporting. 
Yeah, we absolutely are. Because in many cases, um, instructor supply is a key pinch point. Um, and that's true across the board. Um, it's something that we hear from community colleges trying to start up these programs that it's hard for them to find the right instructors. It's hard for them to maintain a competitive rate of pay. Um, so this is an ongoing conversation in terms of how do we support mo more folks being part of the training process of this? And potentially, how do we look at innovative solutions that might allow technology to play part of the role um, and provide some baseline support and additional scaling where there's a shortage of individuals? So it's definitely a both end. It's a common conversation. Um, it's one of the things that we talk about with, you know, offering, say, our capacity grants that sometimes organizations need the capacity to just even spend the time to have to, to fund a search and to do that initial training or upskilling or to take an instructor that's teaching one type of course and could transition but needs a year to get up to speed to add that on. So we look at it from a coordination aspect and we also look at it from a funding aspect. Perfect. Um, Jennifer, are internships an effective pathway to meet the demand? So internships are one, one part of the picture. Um, and, you know, the Mass EC internship program um, has a long history. It's been running for over 10 years, and we've served, I believe at this point, over 6,000 interns or very close. Um, and many of the folks across the ecosystem recognize the importance of having those interns. And then beyond our own programs, we certainly see that having that piece of work-based learning that is really, you know, really the hallmark of an internship provides an opportunity for folks to really understand if it's the right fit for them, provides a de-risking for employers. So certainly it's a part of the piece. Um, I would say that the term internship is less resonant in some of the skilled trades. And there's a need to think about, you know, what on the job training support looks like aligned with apprenticeships and certifications. So in those places, the way we traditionally think about internships may not be the exact right fit. Um, we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, I will ask those, but know that if your question is not answered here, uh, we will be following up uh, via email uh, to respond to your question. Um, so with that, um, there is reference to um, the clean energy innovation pathway. Um, and of course now I've lost it. Um, can you speak more to how the clean energy innovation pathway um, is, um, sorry, this is, this is a little, how um, uh, a program like this, um, uh, sorry, fits into the Massachusetts clean energy workforce goals. Sure. So we were excited this spring to announce a partnership with DESE, um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed and the Executive Office of Education to utilize their, um, their standing and successful innovation pathway programs that they deploy in high schools that are interested in making sure that young people have broader exposures to industries and to work-based learning as part of their high school education. And in the past, clean energy was not one of the um, approved industries and that's changed. So this year we'll be piloting with a handful of schools and then opening up to a broader set. I think this is exactly the kind of um, thing that we need on the awareness front because it is a broader exposure strategy. So it doesn't necessarily target just one occupation, but in the case of the, um, the innovation pathways, you're often helping students get a sense of the whole industry and dozens of potential occupations, which is really helpful at that age stage um, so that they can get a sense of what might be the absolute right fit for them. Um, we want people to want to be part of this industry. We also want them to land on, on the career that really matches their skills and interests. Great. Um, so a question for Phil. Um, did you account for remote or distance learning training programs that are not physically cited in Massachusetts for the 32 priority occupations? Yeah, so we, we did look at remote um, uh, training opportunities. You know, obviously not every single remote training opportunity exists across the, the world, right? But um, we did look at some of the more frequently cited um, certification programs and other training programs that employers report or, you, you know, or the workers reported having. We did look at those. Um, we did look at those as well. And, right. and I'll just note that, uh, you know, the finding there is that, you know, in some roles, the remote training options work really well. In other roles, they really were were not very highly rated. So it there are some challenges with thinking about 
being able to train for a bulk of these jobs using exclusively remote learning. Great. Yep. Um, so I think we've got time for one more question. It's a it's a two part question here, um, and I can uh, help to kind of frame part of it here. Um, so it's a will the clean energy jobs numbers grow past 2030? Um, and then as part of that, um, what are the current plans for growing awareness in interest in these jobs in order to grow the overall supply of the workforce? Um, so to answer, I'll, I'll jump in on the first part, um, are these numbers projected to grow past 2030? Um, and the answer is that although um, this report is not really focused beyond 2030, we do have numbers that uh, show that the, the growth is expected to grow pretty tremendously beyond 2030 across a range of different, um, uh, you know, different uh, sectors. So uh, if you look at the report, there is uh, reference to um, growth of uh, 74 percent by 2050 so that's uh, you know full-time equivalent workers um, and again by by 2030 um, full-time equivalent workers is 30 percent so it is expected to continue to grow past past 2030 and uh, Jennifer maybe I'll, I'll pass it to you just briefly to talk about um, the awareness piece of that question yeah um I think when it comes to awareness we need to we need to hit on multiple fronts and that's what we're trying to do so we're looking at um, how do we integrate with existing programs that are in the middle, middle and high school space, both in terms of schools that are programs that are run by schools themselves, but also community based partners that play a big role in work based learning or career exposure. Um, how do we get a foothold and for clean energy into those programs, in addition to sometimes um, launching additional ones, but I think in many cases there's a lot of strong programs out there to work with. And then when it comes to broader career awareness, it's not just about young people, they're, they're certainly our future, but um, we want adults to understand and have the message of these jobs being part of what's available to them. So, you know, that's part of one of the big things that we baked into funding is really allowing grantees to have the space to do more outreach, recruitment, marketing, um, and looking at how we collaborate together to provide tools that amplify that. So I, I think, it's a big part of what we anticipate doing going forward. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for asking a wonderful range of questions. Uh, for those that we didn't have time to respond to, we will connect with you offline. And with that, I will uh, pass it on to Jennifer for our closing. Yeah, I don't have too much more to say except echoing Elizabeth's thank yous and then also letting you know that in addition to posting the, the recording, posting the deck and also answering any questions that were remaining, we're also available for ongoing questions or dialogue around this. So, you know, if you have a general question about the report, you can reach out to our workforce at masscc.com email. Um, if you think that this is something that your that your organization or a broader set of your colleagues would benefit from having a, a presentation on or having a dialogue about, Elizabeth's a great point person for figuring out how we can connect with you. And then also we will continue to share more updates, not only in terms of um, the funding that we're doing that's relative to this, but also as we continue to do more research and to produce more um, more useful collateral out of the base of this report. There's a lot that we still have to mine through and want to share. Um, so thank you everyone for taking the time to spend you know, an hour with us this morning. We hope the rest of your summer is a good one and that we hear from you about anything that you're interested with regard to this report.